So we are now at the part of the meeting. Um, first, let me just point out before I say anything else that we are recording now. Um, this is because I think uh, some of the content of this meeting will be of interest to people who couldn't make it. And I do intend to make this part of, of the meeting available to watch on through our website. So um, now you have all been warned. Uh, we are here now to talk about the update to the well ordinance. I'm going to share this presentation with um, John here and Kevin, who's um, tuning in remotely. Uh, and we're going to tag team and just provide as much background as we can. We do have a couple members of the uh, technical advisory committee here. We have Dave Landino in the room. Um, commissioners, um, OK, who was it? <laughs> Gillespie. Uh, Lockwood representing, um, you were there representing PV Water. Uh, Largay. Largay, thank yeah. you. I was like, <laughs> uh, I tried for that position, but I was down a little bit. So, uh, yeah, no hard feelings. <laughs> um, and then we also have Rob Swartz, I saw on the, on the um, call, who was on the committee representing the Groundwater Sustainability Agencies for Santa Cruz and Mid County. So, um, if there are anything, if I say anything or misspeak or mischaracterize anything, anyone who was at those meetings, please feel free um, to, to correct me or anybody else who's presenting. Um, we plan to go through the whole presentation and then um, open it up to the commission first for comments and questions and clarifications, and then open it up um, to the public. Uh, there will also be opportunity for anybody who's interested to send us comments after the meeting is over if they either need more time than they would have or if we run out of time at the end of the meeting. Um, so with that, I'm going to dive right in. Um, hopefully everybody on the call is able to see my screen. Uh, okay. It was going so well. Give me one second. All right, everybody. Stop sharing. This. Wait, is this just a minor technical difficulty? That's Has this been presented outside of the uh, committee prior to this meeting? Um, we have had several small meetings about this, but we haven't presented to any public groups. Stakeholder type kind of stuff. It only, yeah, people who've been involved with the technical development, okay. but not any outside stakeholder groups yet. So this is sort of the kickoff to our public um, public process. Uh, so the agenda was also included in the packet today. Um, we have, we're going to go through the introduction to, to the need for why we are doing this process. It's been a year now since we really talked about it in, at length in this body. So we'll go kind of a little bit of a reminder there. Um, we're going to talk about what the process has been and what it's going to look like um, moving forward for the update. And then we're really going to dive into some of the content um, some of it does get a little bit technical, but the most technical document was in the in the packet. And if you really want to dive in, um, we can have offline conversations about some of that. Um, so there's there's a couple things that we're going to be talking about. There's the the ordinances themselves. There's also the um, resource protection policy, which is sort of the critical link between what the ordinance is and what protections we're putting in place. Um, and we'll talk about why we structured it that way. Um, and then the, we'll talk about our tiered approach, which is an, a new approach for this county about um, how we how we go about evaluating permits. Um, then we'll open it up for discussion, talk about next steps. And then I'm hoping that there will be an action of support by this body at the end. OK, so. What is the purpose of this document? And I'm sorry, I don't have this pulled up on my screen, so I'm sort of looking this way. You want me to I'll look at this one. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is the well ordinance? It, it's, uh, we referenced, we, we're calling it the well ordinance. Hey, Sarah. Oh, yeah? Sorry, 
Sorry to interrupt, but nobody online can see the presentation. Oh, that's problematic. Thank you. You're not seeing my screen at all. Nobody. We only see your like initials, Sierra, in a circle. Oh, oh OK. Um, thank you for letting me know, because everyone in the room was seeing the presentation just fine. Give me one minute. I'm going to. You sounded great. <laughs> okay. It says it's working. Um, this is the, yeah, I'm going to try one more time to share it from here, and then if not, I might, Kevin, have to ask you if you could share it. Do you have the presentation? I oh, don't have the most recent one. I think I do, yeah. Okay. But I, I, I can see it now. Can you see it now? OK. Yeah. How about everyone else? I wonder if you're only I, sharing I, the, I the, the design version and not the presentation version. OK, now can everybody online see it? Yes. Yes. Good, yes. Good work. Great. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, calling that out. Feel free to do that. I yeah. don't know if, any, if there's any other technical problem. Yeah, definitely speak up uh, because <laughs> we can't see you guys. So if if there's any problem, please speak up. Okay. Yeah. okay. This is not quite. It just doesn't have the last two not changes. Yeah. It's uh, mostly there. So the there are two chapters that we're talking about um, with the well ordinance update. There's the the one chapter seven point seven zero is the well water wells chapter currently, and that's really about well construction. Um, it it outlines uh, the location, the standards for construction and repair and reconstruction of wells and now soil borings, um, with the for the purpose of ensuring the groundwater will not be polluted. Um, or contaminated by the, the well. Um, it provides for the guidelines of dis well destructions and how to deal with abandoned wells so that they do not become conduits for contamination. Um, and it's now we're focusing also on how to actually make sure that we are protecting our groundwater and our surface water resources through some of the additions that we've made in this updated chapter. Um, and then again, it, it's implementing policies of uh, various plans. So the, it was always with the general plan and the local coastal plan. And now the new version also references Sigma and our groundwater sustainability plans. Um, chapter 7.73 is more about the water that's produced from the well. So it's really um, it's about ensuring that if somebody is relying on a well for whatever purposes they need, that the water quality and the yield of that well is sufficient. Um, and there are many reasons for this that we will get into. OK, so um, what, well, why do we need a well ordinance? Well, for one thing, there are wells all over the county um, and, you know, each individual well can be very small. Um, many of them are only serving one residence and probably using less than a half or an acre foot, maybe even closer to a quarter acre foot of water a year. Um, so each individual well is likely not having much of an impact, but cumulatively with there are over 9,000 wells in the county. And so there cumulatively could be significant impacts if um, if we weren't regulating them on water quality, on water supply um, and on natural resources. And this is from our well database, which we are working on updating. Um, so before you can really think about updating your well, ordinance, you really need to, we, we did some um, deep dives into the current data that we have, the databases and, and our tracking to see um, what, how, how, how many people are still putting in wells, what does that look like? Um, it was really interesting and a really valuable process that helped us kind of provide context to the regulations that we are proposing. Uh, so there's only, um, over the last five-year period that we studied, we were only getting about from a new well perspective, about 10 permits a year for domestic wells, which is, those are the small individual residences. And then for non-domestic wells, which could be um, water systems, could be irrigation, could be um, uh, commercial or uh, 
you know, maybe industrial quarries that things like that. We're only getting about one and a half a year if you look at the average. So the amount of new water being used, and we define that as um, wells being put in in places that there weren't previously wells. This is basically a development of a new water source. Uh, we're talking pretty small numbers every year. Um, replacement wells we see a lot more frequently. So that is replacing the well in the same location with around the same estimated water use and at around the same depth as um, a currently existing well. Um, we see more of those per year, um, but again, not, not a lot. Um, and then supplemental wells are, are wells that are there to help augment an existing well, sometimes because of declining um, yields. Um, and so again, our overall numbers um, are, are pretty small here, and particularly when we look at new water use, where there might be a new impact that hasn't yet been experienced, they're particularly small. Um, any Anything to add or? No, okay. Uh, so the reasons, there are a lot of reasons for the update, and we've presented about this in the past as well. Um, the last update was in 2009, and so really a whole lot has changed since then, and it's continuing to change kind of at a, at a pretty quick clip. Um, we have the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We have now, um, well, we were already working with PV Water. There are now two other groundwater agencies, and they have power, greater powers and a much more um, concerted push for gathering data, so um, especially through metering. Um, we also have, as you know, as the drought response body for Senate Bill 552, there's greater expectations now that the county is being protective of domestic well um, users and considering the impacts to domestic wells of drought and, and other water quality concerns that just really hadn't been brought to the forefront in the past. And there was also a push during the drought from um, the governor's office to make sure that new wells going in were not having impacts on surrounding wells. And so there was an executive order that is now requiring a, a lot of pretty significant analysis for especially large wells being put in um, in the county. So all of this is fairly new. So is um, a lot of case law that's taken place over the last um, decade focusing on environmental impacts primarily. So what is the role of CEQA and CEQA analysis when it comes to groundwater permitting um, and use? And what is the role of or the impacts that groundwater extraction is having on public trust? So mainly surface water bodies, um, technically navigable waterways is the term, um, but really anything that's got protected or endangered species um, is something that's being used in our consideration of public trust values. Um, we also have our, the county has a climate action and adaptation plan now. We have our draw response and outreach plan, and we're trying to be responsive to those um, uh, more recently adopted policies by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service um, sent a letter to the county board um, a couple of years ago, raising very serious concerns about the um, potential impact of having a well policy that was entirely reliant on ministerial well permits, except for in very specific uh, uses um, in specific cases. Um, and then we also were not regulating soil borings, which was actually um, is, is something that most of the rest of the state does do and require and the county should have a role in. Um, and yeah, just overall concern about making sure that we are being gathering the data that we need to help domestic well owners during um, challenging times. So that sort of summarizes why now is the time to move forward on this and why it was needed, um, because it is a lot of work. So I make sure everything are doing wisely. Please. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So those are the reasons. So what are the goals? Um, the goals of our updates, and I'm, these are text-heavy slides. We have talked about making them a little bit more uh, interesting as we do more public workshops, but we didn't really have time to hone them to perfection just yet. But um, uh, you know, what are our goals? Well, first of all, we want to make sure that we are being responsive to case law and um, 
acts like the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and policies that the Board of Supervisors has put in place um, and honoring core tenants of our general plan, which, which um, really include a lot of recognition of the value of agriculture in the county. So, you know, the solution to solving our groundwater problems is not to not allow people to drill wells, it's to find ways to make sure that they can still do that um, when necessary and important for, um, you know, our what we value as a county, uh, but without having significant and considerable harm to uh, the resources. So we wanted to make sure that public trust resources were included in a way that they have been, I feel like, in our current ordinances to some extent, but really not through extensive review and study. So um, we did a lot of work on that. Um, we do want to make sure that there are limited, we, we still want it to be easy for domestic well owners, particularly those who need replacement wells, to be able to get their well it, it done as quickly as possible. Like we're trying to make sure that this process is not overly onerous, especially in cases where there's not likely to be a great impact. Um, however, if there is likely to be a, a significant impact of a well, say a really large capacity well that's in a new area, potentially by some valuable resources, then we wanna make sure that there is appropriate level of review. Um, and we want to facilitate better communications with both the groundwater sustainability agencies and other um, entities that might have an interest in this. Um, and then again, acknowledging climate change is sort of the core tenant of a lot of what we've been doing uh, from a water perspective. Okay. All right, so the process has been, um, we brought this to you about a year ago. This this commission um, met about a year ago, and it was the August meeting, I believe, one year ago, where we asked um, where we started the process to start our CAC. But before that, we'd spent another year before that really collecting data, looking at what other counties um, were doing, um, and and getting an idea of really what this process is going to entail. Um, so where we are right now. Um, we're basically at step two <laughs> or step three. Um, so we have collected all the data. We've been talking to everybody that we can. We had our technical advisory committee meetings, um, and now we have our preliminary uh, draft recommendations that have been vetted by the technical advisory committee, as well as um, many follow-up conversations with um, some interested parties. Um, and step five. Yeah, we're at, yeah, sorry. Step three was the one that needed the, a year ago. The initial one. Okay. Yeah. Step five. All right. Let's get back. <laughs> Not even halfway through. <laughs> uh, so after this meeting, um, let me make sure that I say everything right. So, yes, after this is CEPA. So after this is CEQA, and in, in parallel with CEQA, we're also working with staff um, here at the in our planning department, and we're also going to be working with Coastal Commission staff. So um, we're going to be bringing this more broadly to the other decision makers um, who are ultimately going to be a part of this approval process. Um, we will then have a public hearing through the Planning Commission because any ordinance update that is changing our local coastal plan, which we are in this one, uh, needs to go to the Planning Commission. So in terms of public um, outreach, comment, and review, that will be sort of the next opportunity for members of the public um, to see this. It will then go to our Board of Supervisors. Um, it will then go to the Coastal Commission. And it's possible that there will be enough changes through any of those processes that we may need to reconvene the Technical Advisory Committee, or at least some subsets of it, um, and we might need to return to the Board of Supervisors if there are significant changes required. Um, and then once it's all done, we will make sure that this information is available to everybody who needs to know about it and potentially create formal agreements if that is needed. All right, context. This is really critical, and this was something that we sort of failed to do early in our technical advisory committee meetings, was just to provide some of the context of who the situation in Santa Cruz County, because people are coming from other parts of the state. 
um, and really watching what we're doing because this is a critical issue and a lot of counties are, are looking to this as our environmental groups, as our industry groups, and we want to we wanted to make sure everything we were doing um, was appropriate for Santa Cruz. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily appropriate to be a model for everywhere else. And that's due to some context. So we don't have hardly any growth in the rural areas here anymore in the county. Um, we, like I said, we're getting about 10 new wells a year. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on that. It's not just because it's hard to live out in the mountains. It's also because there aren't a lot of develop developable parcels left where you have road access, um, where you have, um, where you would likely find water, where you're going to be able to get insurance. Um, it's it's a pretty built up area in our rural community, and we're not likely to see a lot more of that. And um, we also have Measure J that restricts growth. So even as new housing demands come in, the local jurisdictions, county in particular, is not directing any large housing developments outside of the existing urban services line, which includes water utilities. Um, so we, we estimate that de minimis use is less than a half an acre foot a year. It's a very low water use. And if you, you compare it to some other counties, you can see a domestic property using a lot more water than you do here. And that's because um, partly I think our environment is just well suited to redwood trees and people don't tend to have lawns and redwood trees in close proximity. We also have a lot of fairly small parcels in some of our rural areas compared to other places. And it's just not as hot here as it is in some other parts of the state. So um, we just, we do see less water use than in other places. Um, and then we also, there are obviously a lot of mitigations, especially new development has a lot of water conservation requirements, including in landscapes, um, stormwater infiltration is required for new developments. Um, and then anywhere that's on a well is also on the septic system. So you also have that sort of built in return flow that offsets a lot of the impact of the pumping um, as well. Um, yeah, uh, I will talk about some of the um, updates that we're making to, well, Kevin will talk about some of the studies that we have done to look at how can we further reduce impacts uh, based on our analysis. Um, we also don't have significantly declining groundwater levels. That's another thing that's pretty different about us than in a lot of the rest of the state. If you look at the monitoring of most of the groundwater basins, and not to take this out of context, it's not like there's not still challenges there, but we don't actively have groundwater levels declining at significant rates. And that's not the case in a lot of the rest of the state as well, where um, most of our basins have declined significantly over time, but have been in a fairly steady state for quite some time. Um, and those that are challenged are also being managed very well by the groundwater agencies. Um, Yes, and, and again, we do feel that it is very important that if there is, which is not something we see often, but if there are new non-de minimis well users coming in, they really do need to do some pretty significant analysis because um, it's there's no place in the county where they're not likely to have an impact. This would be the exciting part of the presentation every time we need to change a the slide. There we go. <laughs> All right, um, this is, I'm now gonna hand it over to John for the next slides to talk about some of the major changes that we're making. And just a little background, you guys all know me, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I am working as a, as a consultant now helping, helping Sierra out on this. I did the last update back in 2009. It actually was a six year process, I think there, so. Uh, brought some of that experience back to, to uh, help out with this um, and doing some of the background analysis, particularly related to surface water issues and that sort of thing. Um, but there, you've probably seen the ordinance in the packet. There are a lot of changes throughout the ordinance, but what we tried to do here was just summarize the uh, the significant changes, one of the big ones were changing the name from water wells to wells and borings because it does include um, soil borings now. Uh, we've added 
a number of measures to reduce the impacts on groundwater resources, streams, and the public trust resources, and karst areas, nearby wells, and some of the designated groundwater extraction concern areas. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, we are proposing different levels of review for different types of wells, essentially the tiered system, tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four. Again, so that the, the, the easy wells, the domestic wells, those are tier one and they can be processed relatively easily. It gets more complicated. And by the time you get to tier four, those are no longer ministerial permits, they're discretionary, they're subject to secret review and secret compliance and fairly extensive evaluation for these larger new wells that have a significant potential for impact. Um, we did add explicit provisions for the review and comment of the well applications by water agencies and the, uh, the groundwater sustainability agencies. We've always done that, but it was never really written in the ordinance. And now there's there's authority uh, to allow them to comment and uh, potentially kick things, kick a well into a higher tier requiring uh, additional evaluation. Uh, we are adding provisions for well for regulation of borings and also stormwater infiltration devices. That's something where the state is going to looking at dry wells and what the potential impact of theirs. So we put a placeholder in there. And this gets back to the issue of what's in the ordinance and what's in separate policy. The ordinance takes a lot of effort to, re to update because it is a local coastal program implementing ordinance. It does require planning commission approval, board approval, and um, coastal commission approval. So what we've done with the ordinance is essentially provide the, the authority to do a lot of these things. And then we reference out to the details would be developed in policy. The details of implementation would be developed by policy. One of the key policies is the resource protection policy. And because there's so much in that, we actually are going to have the Board of Supervisors adopt that by resolution. So there is board review and board approval of that policy. Uh, some of the other policies are more in-house, developed by the health officer and, and not so complicated. But that resource protection policy is, is pretty critical. Um, we are going to be requiring metering of all newly installed non-domestic wells. Um, again, the numbers you saw were not significant. Um, we're not that significant. Most of our wells are domestic, but those that are not, we want to get a better handle on what the water use is. We feel like we have a pretty good handle on water use of domestic wells from looking at our small water systems and how much water they use. But the non-domestic uses we need to get a better handle on those. And again, where I mentioned there's various places in the ordinance for the call out promulgation of specific policies for implementation. A question though, um, since the non-de minimis or de minimis user number is so small, why would you require standalone metering just as good practice? For the non-de minimis, we are. You are. For yeah. non-de minimis. For, uh, non -de -minimis. Uh, but de minimis, you're not. Right. De minimis, we're not. So as a, as a homeowner, you know, grew up in LA with Colorado tap water and had no idea where water come, came from. 20 years ago, I lived in the house, I had to learn about what else. And if I have a micro, a small leak, I have no idea. Right. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it just seems like, and I we've talked about this before, trying to go back and retrofit existing Domestic wells would be used pitchforks and torches or something mm -hmm. like that. They change the quote, yeah, um, which would be very hard to do. But net, it would seem like net new construction, net new wells for domestic, pure domestic use would certainly benefit by at least the standalone, some standalone meter, be it smart or down mechanical or cloud or whatever. And there's my option out there. Well, we always recommend that, yeah, but we chose not to mandate that. Uh, in this in this go round again, there is a, there is a certain issue of avoiding pitchforks and torches and sure. going off in there. We also, you know, a lot of what we've done too is is look at how much staff time it takes to implement things, how much, you know, where the bang for the buck is. Do we want to spend a bunch of time fighting with a bunch of individual small users, or do we want to really be able to focus on the big issues? So. 
those are some of the trade-offs that we looked at when we were developing this. And you're you're welcome to make recommendations, but our recommendation is to not meter the uh, the de minimis users at this point in time. Um, and I, I did go through that whole experience where we did try to meter them, and it was it was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> But I did take the ringleader of that and I included him in the TAC the last time we did an update. So uh, it worked out in the uh, in the long run. Um, these are the some of the critical definitions and this whole tiered approach is really based on what type of well. So that's why we uh, put together this slide and this is almost word for word what the definitions are in the uh, the, the the resource protection policy and in the ordinance, uh, the definitions are in the ordinance as well. But again, de minimis is less than two acre feet per year for domestic use, and that actually comes out of sigma that definition. But it's also one that was already in our well ordinance. We already drew had a distinction of two acre feet per year. If you did, if you use less than two acre feet per year. Um, and less than four connections, domestic connections, then the, the requirements were less stringent. If you were not, did not meet in that category, you had to do uh, water efficiency, implement water efficiency measures in the in the old ordinance. And we're taking that for further now to require metering of any non-de minimis use. And we're also gonna be requiring a checklist of water efficiency measures for the de minimis users as well. So. Uh, that one's being carried a little bit further. Uh, we do recognize that people could have some extensive landscaping, but we're saying you have you, you, it's got to be less than a half acre of landscaping if you want to still be considered de minimis uh, and non-commercial. Uh, so, and we're not measuring it uh, on those de minimis ones. How how do we know that it's too acre? Well, we do measure many rural rural properties and consistently it's less than a half an acre foot per year. Um, again, it gets back to, you know, somebody is not going to be just pumping a bunch of water for no good reason. Um, and if they are pumping a whole bunch of water, a lot of it's probably going to be soaking back into the ground too, um, if they're if it's not being put to use. Um, and and that's where the half acre foot of landscaping came from, because if somebody, um, this was a question that was raised by some of the environmental groups that were concerned that we might have, you know, sure, maybe most people are not using that much, but what if someone had just like really extensive landscaping and they were irrigating that kind of around the clock and that's, that's how we came up with the half an acre foot because we we think it's very unlikely and would be challenging for someone to use more than two acre feet a year without significant landscaping. Uh, so that that's where that number came from. Yeah. Um, and then the, the distinction between a new well and a replacement well is also very critical um, in the in the assigning of tiers, primarily when it gets to the the non domestic wells. But again. A new well is something that's going to serve a sig new or significantly expanded use over what's currently being used. And we tied, tied that to uh, the, the maximum annual amount of water extracted in the last five years for that particular use, because we know it can vary from year to year, depending on whether it's a wet year or a dry year. Um, <clears throat> but we don't want them to go significantly over what they have historically been used using. If they do go over, if they propose to go over a new crop, new type of crop, new water, uh, high water demand crop, then it would be treated as a new well and a new use, uh, even though it might be serving the same piece of property. Um, so again, replacement wells and supplemental wells that do not uh, represent any significant increase in water use are handled as as tier two um, tier two tier two wells um, with less as you'll see there's less impact on those tier two users so that they can replace their well and continue to maintain their use. We're still not tracking the replacement well that is being replaced due to drying up due to drought. I, I don't think we were tracking it before, as I recall. Uh, we do track that. Well, 
we, if they want any sort of assistance, they have to tell us that their well went dry due to drought. But we don't necessarily require that, require that they share. Seems like that why they need a replacement well. Seems like that data point would be a good indicator. Yeah, that forward for climate change and drought. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to put a drill in the well, replace the or rather do the drought. It would be good to know that. Yes, that that comes down to just our our forms, though. Luckily, not something that gets outlined in so this. The form still doesn't capture that information. Yeah, not from yeah. not that I know of. I mean, one of the things we did do is we looked hist historically at the number of well permits that we we had been getting. In the old, you know, 10 or 20 years ago when we had a drought, the number of well permits went up significantly. Mm -hmm. The more recent drought we've had, we haven't really seen that much of an increase because so many of the wells are drilled deeper now that they, they can survive a drought without going dry. But the older wells, the ones that were put in back in the 70s and 80s, those were sh more shallow wells that did go dry during drought. Okay. Uh, so we're not, we in this county, we're really not seeing the significant drought impacts on individual wells like other, other places seem to. Um, so the resource protection policy is sort of where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, it is a separate policy, as I mentioned, because we want to be able to have the ability to do adaptive management. A lot of it is very new, um, so we may need to do some fine tuning as we implement it. So um, that's why we're setting this up as a policy, um, but again, adopted by board resolution. And there's a number of provisions in there <clears throat> to minimize the impacts on streams and their public trust resources. The definitions of the different types of wells, we just went over that, that's in that policy. We also uh, identify critical streams and the amount of stream flow that needs to be maintained in each of those streams, the amount of depletion, additional depletion might be allowed. And we'll get we'll get into that a little more detail on that. Sean? Yeah. I'm question number one. Um, and look, reading through it, I only got about 75%. I cannot find a definition for stream in your definitions. Would a seasonal gully, when it rains, be a stream, <clears throat> or is it a year-round stream? We are, when we're talking about the policy, we're talking about fish-bearing streams, okay. or tributaries to fish-bearing streams that actually flow, you know, more than just in response to rainfall. There's a lot of criteria on setbacks from streams. I would suggest we, Define what is spring is meant mm -hmm. in the definitions of terms. Okay. Yeah, we, we have a we have a definition in the uh, sewage ordinance that we could probably drop this. <laughs> um, but it's yeah, I'm surprised. Okay. I guess we don't have a definition. I didn't find it, but yeah. I didn't go all the way to yeah, the no, document. It would have been in the beginning of the ordinance, but uh, it's, that's, a, that's a good thought. Thank you. Um, And we do have a map of streams that we'll really be showing uh, in a little bit. Um, we have provisions in there to minimize the impact on nearby wells in terms of requiring setbacks or analysis of what the impact would be on a, on a nearby well in terms of potentially impacting groundwater levels. Uh, we're requiring that any uh, non de minimis well that's in a karst area be thoroughly evaluated. And if if our mapping of karst is not, we know it's not complete. So if a non de minimis well is being drilled and they encounter karst, they would need to stop and do an analysis of that situation. It does not apply to the de minimis wells, but it does apply to, to non de minimis wells. Uh, the environmental review requirements are uh, required for Tier 4 wells. They need to comply with CEQA. Uh, they would be considered discretionary uh, permits. Uh, again, metering is required. Metering and reporting of water use uh, reporting that needs to be self-reporting on an annual basis. And then there's uh, enforcement measures in the ordinance that if somebody did not report, we can go out to their property and get that information ourselves. Um, we do require the water use efficiency measures for both agriculture and, uh, and domestic use and other types of uses. Uh, 
Uh, and then we also have additional requirements for some of these mapped groundwater extraction concern areas. We have limited yield areas where we believe that more stringent yield testing should be required. Uh, we have a number of properties uh, in the summit area where they got well permits, they put in their wells, and almost every summer they have to haul water. So we want to tighten up the, the Fractured, yeah. sorry, fractured granite. Exactly. Well, or fractured hard rock, sandstone, yeah. shale, whatever. Yeah. Um, we have elevate. We have water quality concern areas where we're concerned both about the suitability of the water for the designated use, but also the potential for cross contamination between aquifers, where we would require construction of a well in a way that there would the contaminants would not be able to to move into a, a from a contaminated zone to a, a cleaner zone. And then we also have uh, seawater intrusion areas along the coast that would require more analysis as well. Um, so let's see what's next. <laughs> Let's, let's all find out together. <laughs> so this is sort of the the this table summarizes the nuts and bolts of the of the resource protection policy and the whole tiered structure. Um, the first column there, well, the second column gives sort of the definition of what would how a well would fit into what tier, whether it's tier one, tier two, or tier three. Uh, basically, the tier one are all the de minimis uh, domestic wells. Tier two are replacement non-de minimis wells, replacement or supplemental wells, whether it's a water system or an ag use or industrial use. Tier three, we get into new non-de minimis wells uh, that are on the smaller side, less than five acre feet per year. And then 50. 50, sorry, 50 acre feet per year and are consistent with the groundwater sustainability plan and the location where they're being uh, drilled. And then tier four is anything that doesn't meet those, those uh, criteria, larger new wells over 50 acre feet per year. Um, and our median, just to give you a sense of the scale, our median agricultural well right now in South County, I believe is around 80, 50 to 80 acre feet per year. The, the median size is based on our well permits. Uh, I think our biggest well that we have seen in the last five years was 225 acre feet per year. So we don't have the huge wells that say you have in the Central Valley or the Salinas Valley, but if it's over 50 acre feet per year, we want a, a tier four evaluation if it's a new well, a new use. So just for clarity for me, uh, if I looked at San Andreas Mutual, we would be, and we were doing a replacement well, that would that be tier two? That would yeah. be tier two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And again, the third column there gives you a, another sense of what kind of, how many permits per year do we really see on those types of wells? And you can see, you know, tier three, there's, there's one permit per year. Tier four, less than one. I mean, we, we don't even, we don't know yet. I mean, but they, they may come through and we need to be ready to deal with those. The, mo the majority of them are, are clearly the, the domestic wells. The, 44 permit season mm -hmm. domestic, and that includes both new and new replacement domestic wells. And mm -hmm. then the, uh, the non de minimis, um, you know, those are primarily those replacement non de minimis wells, those are primarily ag wells, the occasional industrial well. If I recall correctly, municipal wells that are within city limits are not, they're exempted from this, or do they have their own? approval process the county's not right the county the county only has jurisdiction over the unincorporated area okay. now some places for instance the city of scotts valley and the city of uh, capitola uh refer have the county implementing power ordinance within their jurisdiction but city of watsonville and city of santa cruz have their own well permitting process and so does we also don't have jurisdiction over like state lands so you know UCSE or other state park properties. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a gray area. Yeah. To, to, yeah. <laughs> right. 
um, just on the table, uh, comparable to the rest of the counties. Is this an aggressive or, you know, we're trying to be more aggressive comparably to other counties, or is this the typical? You know, other counties do have a tiered approach. Some of their thresholds, I believe, are actually higher than some of ours because our wells are generally smaller. Our thresholds are are, are somewhat lower. Um, they require, um, I think, uh, Glen County is one of those that has uh, Stanislaus also has some. You know, we, we kind of got the idea of a tiered approach from them, but then we did our own thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sonoma is the other county that I would say has done the most from a, the yeah. stream protection and resource protection perspective. Um, and I, I would say that we are a little bit easier than them, but we're, I think, actually quite similar. We've been in close contact with their planners and um, they have more restrictions on certain types of landscaping that we didn't feel was necessary here because we don't have giant lawns on all of our domestic well properties. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I also know there's a lot of counties that have put, um, there are, are some counties that have done moratoriums on wells based on some recent case law and concerns, um, which is not ideal. And there are some counties and, and places that are sort of looking to see what comes of like ours and, and a few others. So um, this is a topic that's been coming up a lot whenever I talk to representatives from other counties. This is a, a pretty big issue. Thank you. Um, so what column indicates whether there's CEQA review required and that doesn't kick in until tier four. Uh, then we have the very the stream setback um, that would be required and we'll see later on how stream setback can reduce the amount of depletion that occurs. Uh, but with the tier one, we're looking to have at least a 50 foot setback and require a 100 foot deep seal. So that, that significantly reduces the amount of depletion that occurs from the well that might be closer or that has only a 50 foot seal. Uh, and ideally, there would be a, they would be in a location where they can actually seal down to an uh, impermeable layer and actually seal out the whole upper upper part of the, the well. As you as you go up in tiers, the, the requirements become more stringent. 100 foot setback for a tier two well, um, and a 200 foot deep seal. This is within 2,000 feet of a stream. These these would apply. Um, and then tier three, we actually apply an analytical model to determine what the depletion would be and whether what needs to be done to minimize the, the depletion to the allowable amount, which we'll see in a, a subsequent table. And then we also have setback requirements to nearby wells. It turns out the impacts on nearby wells are not as significant as the stream impacts um, when you apply some of these calculations. So we should probably move on. Okay. Oh, what are we saying? doing time-wise? I have 15. So we have about 45 minutes. I think the presentation is probably another 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just had a quick question. I thought at one point the permitting, well, permitting process, approval process was going to go to the groundwater management agencies. I think I read that a kind of year ago. Does that ring a bell for anybody? No? No. No. They have to, right now under the executive order, you have to send well permits to them to, they basically have to sign off on them. That means, is that what you're thinking? So they're not managing any of the process. It's more information. Yes, yeah. and, and they can, what we're proposing is they could raise significant issues, which they could say this is not consistent with our groundwater sustainability plan. And then that kicks it into tier four for a more, thorough analysis of what the impacts of that well would be. Um, and this is the critical stream table. It's also a part of that. And what we did is we, the amount of allowable additional, groundwater wells will, will deplete stream flow. 
essentially by intercepting water that would otherwise flow into the creek, lowering the groundwater level so water may actually, uh, the creek may actually lose water to the groundwater basin or, or otherwise drawing water from the creek. Um, so what we have done is calculate an amount of allowable depletion in the different streams that's based on both the resource value and the amount of depletion they are already experiencing from either groundwater extraction or also from surface water extraction. And this is something we work very closely with uh, the environmental stakeholders uh, NOAA Fisheries and State Fish and Wildlife uh, very concerned about this issue um, and what the impacts of wells on streams would be. Uh, Sonoma County, as Sierra mentioned, has done some of the most work where they they map different different streams and how how important the different streams were. Um, and we took a somewhat similar approach based on. You know, how streams are identified in the steelhead and the coho recovery plans, which are the core streams, which are the most important streams for, for fish recovery. And then again, looking at how much have they been depleted. And that's based on there's a they have put together a natural flows database statewide that allows us to estimate what the unimpaired flows would be in a stream right now. Um, and it's also a lot of it's based on information that we already have in the county from our various stream flow measurements over the years, our watershed management plans, and then also some of the modeling that was done for the groundwater sustainability plans where the models estimated what the amount of depletion was based on the groundwater models. Uh, so this is, this is a subset of the streams from the county, basically what would fit on a screen. Uh, but the first column is, is what the resource value is, and that refers back up to the upper part of the table. Well, there's really two tables here. There's the there's the you know the the allowable depletion calculation, and then there's the individual stream uh, rows. And you know we've got the estimated dry season unimpaired flows. And if you look at the actual document, there's other columns in there that says what the data sources are of all that and where that inf how that information was developed. Uh, so we've got the un what we estimate the unimpaired flow is, and like primarily from that natural flows database, and then what the what the dry season observed flow is right now. In some cases, the observed flow is more than the unimpaired flow, which I think points more to flaws in the data than uh, than actual uh, actual conditions. Uh, so we have then we estimate what that what the de depletion the current depletion is, and then based on that, what the allowed additional depletion is. Now, so, sorry, depletion based on. Proximity wells to the water sources. That's it's based on what the flow is in the stream right now compared to what it would be if there were not was Unfair. not groundwater pumping and there was, was not surface water diversions. Uh, so you can see Soquel Creek is the most heavily impacted. Lower Soquel Creek and uh, well Valencia is also pretty heavily impacted. Um, where during the dry season. Um, you know, 65% of the flow has been taken either by surface water diversion or groundwater extraction mm -hmm. has lowered the water table to the point where the SoCal Creek actually loses flow as it flows down through SoCal Valley. Um, so, you know, they, they have the, the minimal amount of allowed additional depletion in those areas. Um, we're, we're not really allowing a heck of a lot of additional depletion anywhere. I think the most we could allow is uh, is five percent on these streams, but most of them are only one percent uh, additional depletion. Um, and then the far right column just converts that in cubic feet per second, which is our the standard measure of stream flow. Um, how much could we take out? But for instance, even San Lorenzo big trees where the the dry season flow right now is 12 cubic feet per second. We'd only allow an additional 0.12 to be taken out. So a lot of places we're not, you know, a large, a new large well that's proposed 
If they can limit their depletion to what's in the far right column, they could potentially remain in tier three. But if if it's going to look looks like it's going to be more than that, then that would pick them in the tier four for a much more uh, detailed analysis. There's a lot of information in there. Again, this is in the policy, and we may be developing additional information. As somebody does analysis, they could go in and do more analysis on a particular stream on what the flow is and provide improved information. So this is our map of groundwater extraction concern areas. You can see the streams uh, are, are mapped, uh, the, that 1,000 foot, the, the lighter lighter uh, blue is the 1,000 foot buffer around the stream where a, a, a de minimis well would have to meet those requirements. And then the darker blue is the 2,000 foot buffer where a, a uh, non de minimis well would have to meet those requirements. The purple there are the karst areas where we, or potential karst area, marble and schist where we're, we're concerned about what the impacts of wells on the karst might be. Um, and then the pink areas up in the summit, those are those limited yield areas where we've seen a lot of wells uh, go dry during the summer, where we want to have a, a, a more rigorous yield testing in those areas. The yellow is the seawater intrusion area based on uh, chloride levels over 250 milligrams per liter or just a buffer of 1500, 1500 feet along the coastline. Um, so we want to look more closely at any wells within those areas what the, and analyze what the impacts would be. Uh, and this is the groundwater quality concern area. The yellows are elevated chlorides. And these are based on maps, the gamma maps, and the county has information on water quality from, from wells that have been, dr been drilled since about 1995. I think we required groundwater testing and reporting. Um, so those are areas where the yellows are where we've seen elevated chlorides. The blue is the area where we where we have either seen or suspect we would see elevated chromium-6 the, the aromas uh, formation. The pink is the, uh, what's it, 123 TCP? I forget. What <laughs> you think. Yeah, 123 yeah. TCP, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, oh, the green is an elevated nitrate. Um, so, for instance, the nitrate and the chloride areas, those are areas where we would be concerned about the well potential, well potentially serving as a conduit to have the contaminants move either deeper or up into an aquifer. So there we're going to be looking more closely at con construction and completion of the well. Um, the other areas are where we would want to see testing just to ensure that the water is, is suitable for drinking. So, okay. Okay, so Kevin's going to run through some of the technical stuff. There was a, a fully 100 pages of the packet was sort of <laughs> a really deep technical explanation. And um, this is going to be very high level, but I, I we did want to include it just because this has been the bulk of like the really challenging work that we've had to do has been really about refining some of these um, analyses and and ensuring that we're being protective um, and being able to demonstrate that rather than just us saying like, no, we're telling you so, it's fine. <laughs> um, Kevin, can you? Yeah. Keep this one? Let me know when as, you want me to switch slides. Okay, we'll do. Yeah, as Sierra said, it's kind of like a snippet of what we did for this. So I encourage you to read the analysis along with the very large appendix if you want to dive into the details. Um, but yeah, so for the stream depletion, we looked at a handful of different models, um, all taking into account various setbacks, seal depths, and geologic uh, properties. And it was important we we assumed 180 day uh, dry season pumping so this is pretty crucial because it actually effectively doubles the pumping rate um so it's pretty conservative approach for that 
And then we looked at pumping rates from um, you know, 10 to 10 years intervals. And kind of some context in general, if you evaluate stream depletion on a long enough time frame, then depletion has the potential to be high, highly correlated to extraction rates, especially with aquifers of unfavorable characteristics. So that means um, media such that has high hydraulic conductivities. And this is especially true if you look at um, streams at short distances from the wells. Um, there are certain things that you could do to help mitigate um, the amount of stream depletion, and that includes increasing setbacks, um, ideally pumping beneath an aquitard, or incorporating deep well seals um, that we will look into some of the graphics soon. Um, so some of the other key observations that we discovered um, listed in these bullet points um, include wells pumping 10 acre feet per year had relatively minimal impacts, um, 0.01 to 0.02 cubic feet per second, increasing the seal depth to 100 feet reduced depletion by 20 to 70 percent. Um, this was even greater when you have seal depths of 200 feet, and this is more pronounced at short distances from the stream. And when you get to distances, um, again, depending on the aquifer conditions, such as a thousand feet or greater, then there is, you know, far less influence on well sealed well seals, and the predominant control at that point will be the distance from the stream. Um, the biggest um, reduction of stream depletion happens when you can get a well beneath uh, the, the pumping portion of the well beneath an aquitard, which there's geologic conditions within the county that that is um, possible. And so increasing the stream setback has moderate effect on depletion. So for example, 50 to 1000 feet can reduce it by 25 to 30 percent. Um, however, when you go to 800 to 2000 feet, um, the depletion is reduced by 50% or more. Um, and then kind of separate from stream depletion, we did look at impacts of drawdown to nearby wells by using the modified Tice non-equilibrium equation, um, which was used to determine the amount of setback needed to prevent um, more than or less than five feet of drawdown in nearby wells. So this amounted to uh, 25 to 1400 feet for 100 gallon per minute well, for example. And again, this is depending on the aquifer characteristics. Um, John, do you have anything else to add for that? No, I think that does it. Summary. Okay. Let's look at the pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> From now on, there's less writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, this is a little bit more interesting. Um, this is one of the models we used uh, to simulate the well seal depths impact on stream depletion. So um, this is showing, you know, quite a big impact on the reduction um, in, when you incorporate well seals. So for example, the, the graph on the far left is a well without a well seal. So pumping is occurring in layer zero, which is zero to 100 feet beneath the surface. Um, you step it up to uh, layer one, then you have effectively a 100 foot seal, and then you increase it by twice that amount to layer two, so 200 foot well seal. And so looking at pumping in layer zero to pumping in layer two, then you are reducing stream depletion um, by about half. So those numbers are at the very uh, bottom of each chart. And this example was for a, uh, we use the Santa Margarita formation as an example for a lot of the testing because it kind of provided a large um, range of aquifer properties. So like specifically the hydraulic conductivities were either could be really low or really high for the Santa Margarita formation. And for this 
particular example, this is the median, um, which is, yeah, you can, you can see that the seal depth does um, make a difference, and this was evaluated over 10 years. It, is important to note that the longer you extend the time frame, then the closer the stream depletion um, is to the extraction rate. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So kind of piggybacking on what I just said, um, once you get to greater distances, this the seal depth is not doesn't have as big of an influence. So this is at 800 feet from the stream and uh, this is actually switching to like the most extreme um, like aquifer conditions when relating to stream depletion impacts so in this case the upper end of hydraulic conductivity for the Santa Margarita formation and the lower end of the storativity for the um, same formation um, so as you can see here um, pumping from zero to 100 feet, or effectively no well seal is more or less the same as um, pumping from uh, 200 feet with a well seal of that amount. Um, that's important because at that point, um, setback distance kind of takes over control of what's um, minimizing stream depletion the most. And that's what the next slide is gonna be referring to. Working on it. There we go. So yeah, so taking that 800 feet, which is the um, start of the X axis, and extending it 2,000 feet, um, this is not incorporating any well seals and exclusively looking at just the distance from the stream um, to the well. And kind of as you would expect with a typical cone of depression, it starts to you know, flatten out, um, become, become more broad the farther you you um, are from this, the stream or the well. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a graph of all the wells from 10 acre feet to 100 acre feet per year. The, um, again, it's important to note the extraction rates are actually double that amount to you know, assume that all the pumping is taking place during the 180 day dry season. Next slide, thanks. This is kind of a quick overview of some of the calculations that um, we observed when using a USGS um, web-based application. So this is mainly looking at just setbacks, not incorporating well seals, and you're looking at um, pumping beneath an acritard or no acritard, and um, yeah, setbacks from 50 to 1,000 feet. Not much to really, you know, point out here, just some of the work we did. Yeah. Um, this is, um, the last slide did have some of the results for pumping beneath an aquitard, but this is a good graph to kind of show um, what that looks like. And it really does reduce the amount of stream depletion that's occurring. So all of these um, stream depletion is actually probably, it's about what, double, um, it's reduced by double the amount of the extraction rate approximately. And one thing you will notice though, is it is really reduced early on. So you have two to, um, you have 10 years of pumping in in days in the x-axis and early on in that time interval it's really reduced however it does increase pretty quickly uh, like 1500 days and then it doesn't really start to flatten out for a 25 acre foot um, per year well until about that time and it looks like it's still increasing for a 50 acre foot per year uh, well so this is important because this is why we are requiring um, stream depletion to be analyzed over a long period, such as 10 years. Early on in the process, we had, I think, 180 days, and the environmental groups um, pushed us to look into this a little bit more. And, and this is one of the main reasons why we extended that time frame. 
Um, question or comment, maybe one thing about these models, right? This is assuming, I imagine, not diving into the details, sort of a constant flow over the tenure period, right? Or else just yeah. always steady state conditions. Yeah. So yes, mm -hmm. it probably underestimates actual stream flow impact in that the well, if you're pumping 50 acre feet a year, the model is going to think it's running all the time for every day. In reality, you're going to get those 50 acre feet probably mostly through June, July, and August. You know, maybe it's a little bit, maybe it's like April to October potentially. And it's going to be more intense with longer bursts of yeah. activity. And that was partly why we we compressed the you know the 50 acre feet per year. We compressed them to 100 and we. 280 days. Day. The that pumping is, rate is actually pumping all that at 180 days. So yeah. we we increase the pumping rate. Yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. So like even though it says two acre feet to 50 acre feet per year, it's pretty much double that actually for what we input into the models to kind of constrain that pumping during the dry season. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we're I know we, we only have about 20 minutes left in the meeting. Um, just to touch on the, the last kind of major change that we made to, uh, was to chapter 7.73. Um, again, back to writing on the screen, so sorry about that. But um, one of the major changes is that we are now um, requiring a larger panel of water quality contaminants to be tested at the time um, a well is developed. And that's because we know that there are yeah, we have naturally occurring and also influenced by land use um, contamination. So, and people aren't, we aren't requiring people to test for it right now. So they could be drinking water that they think is safe because they did the, the basic water quality testing we required uh, when actually they have elevated arsenic or um, possibly hexavalent chromium. So we're expanding the panel and then um, to the Title 22 list, which is pretty standard, is what our water systems have to do. Um, and I, I put in, in one of the documents, oh, I don't think we actually had the list of the constituents, it's but- an, it's an optional slide. It's an op oh, okay. <laughs> I'll show you what they are. It's, it, it costs about $170 at um, the local lab to, to run the basic Title 22. Um, and then we might require one, two, three, TCP and hexavalent chromium, depending on what the map showed, which is not the standard. Um, and then John already spoke about the yield requirements. Um, the other big thing is a time of sale requirement for um, properties. If you're uh, on a property that re relies on a well, you'll have to do a yield test and a water quality test at the time of sale. That's informational. We wouldn't say you can't sell your house or that you can't if the water quality is bad, but it's a disclosure that we think is really critical for um, the buyers to be aware of. Um, yeah, that, that's basically those changes. And I think this was the last slide. Oh, there's the next steps. Oh, right. So uh, we sort of talked about this at the beginning, but um, the, uh, after this, We'll see if we get more comments. Um, we'll do. We'll be working on our CEQA evaluation, planning commission, board of supervisors, coastal commission, potentially another board of supervisors, and then developing, uh, working with our partners. And agreements would be say for the cities if we're going to be taking over their well, well permitting process. We would need that to be in an agreement. So. Um, so, uh, Sierra, can I have some yeah. on the last slide? Um, and also the map you put where chlorides and nitrates, are we partnering with our neighboring counties to at least give them so that whatever implementation they have is complementary to ours, especially with PV, where PV is straddling two counties to talk to one base and the other. And farmers that have are farming on different counties? Yeah, we, we have been, I, that's an excellent question. And I think um, a, a very big challenge for people who work in multiple counties or even other jurisdictions throughout the state. Um, we have talked to Monterey County. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're really, like you said, um, they're the ones most likely to have people who are sort of working in both counties. Um, 
and they're definitely following what we're doing. They've kind of put their well update on hold for a number of years now. So um, I, I hope that this can be an example or something that can be used because I, I mean, to wait to your point, it is very challenging right now for um, for people who have to put in wells in multiple places to be dealing with different jurisdictions and different requirements. And we've also looked a lot at what San Mateo County yeah. is doing. A lot, a lot of what we're proposing is similar to what they already require. Yeah, particularly some of the big the water quality yeah. testing. They, 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 yeah. I think both counties require the full Title 22. Yeah. So the proposal here, I just want to make sure uh, at the, by the end of this meeting, if comfortable, you know, it would be what we're asking is for the commission to um, basically endorse these um, and ultimately recommend that it is adopted by the Board of Supervisors so that then when we do go to the Board of Supervisors, I will tell them, you know, we will present that information to them. Um, and then I know that this has been a lot to, to process. The documents were long. I didn't get them out until Friday, so it wasn't enough time necessarily for everyone both in here and on the call to review. This is the very beginning of the public process. This is not the end. So you, you can always contact us. Um, you know, we'd be happy to meet with people if there are follow up questions or conversations. Poor Dave Landino here, we called him into the office like four times to meet with us. <laughs> we need more information. Um, so, you know, please reach out this way. Um, if you want, I think everyone knows how to get in touch with me. So um, I will, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see uh, the folks who are still on the meeting um, and then open it up for questions and comments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any commissioners have any questions and comments before we see if there's any public questions and comments? Um, yes. My one comment is, is that I understand, I know that we have a potential, uh, we have a new standard for hexavalent chromium. Uh, I also know that uh, there's potentially another lawsuit to reverse that standard. So I'd like whatever happens, I'd like, I'd like to make sure that the well ordinance follows whatever the standard is for hexavalent chromium, whatever it ends up being. And if it gets rolled back from 10 to 50 or something like that, that that, that becomes the standard for further. Yeah. We don't have any standards in the ordinance itself. We refer to the state standards. Okay. So whatever the state ends up landing on, that would be the standard that we would apply. Okay. Yeah. We, and we we do we would potentially require people to test for it, but um, we haven't quite finalized whether if it's elevated, they're necessarily required to treat for it. As that's one of the little uh, things that we haven't quite figured yeah. out yet. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I'm coming from a place where. Uh, we will probably end up at some point having a replacement well for a public water system that has hexavalent chromium that's in excess of 10. Yeah. And we wouldn't want to have more onerous standards than what than what we would have otherwise with the state or whatever. Well, also one thing to um, just mention is that there's also a chapter of the county code that is for water systems and it is not this one yeah uh, so those standards are, are sort of separate this is really looking at the individual water systems which is one to four households small water systems is a different chapter of the code so for us i think the question um that we're still grappling with a little bit is our we have required currently we require treatment for the water quality contaminants that we do have people test for if they are in excess of the MCL. And so the question is now that we're requiring significantly more testing, are we going to be requiring treatment? Where we do decide that treatment is necessary, that gets recorded on the deed, which is also um, new 
information because one thing we've been concerned about is that as the house gets sold and maybe yeah. turns over several times, the fact that treatment was required might not yeah. make up. That's good. So, yeah. Like that. um, but that that sort of, especially with hexavalent chromium, I'm like, do we really make a person a household meet the 10 MCL if it if there's a 15? I don't know. So we haven't finalized that, but that's not in the ordinance. Okay. So. Thank you. Question. Yes. So you mentioned at the beginning that this was really the first opportunity, first public hearing and presentation. Yeah. And the last slide was about a recommendation from the commission. <laughs> Do you want that recommendation today? Or what happens if the recommendation comes in October? Or I guess to fill in the dots, yeah. what is the next level or the next attempt at a um, public engagement on this matter? Have you already met with like Jess Brown? Is there going to be a, a further presentation to the Farm Bureau about the yeah. results? Those are excellent questions. So um, I emailed the Farm Bureau about this presentation and I intend to follow up with them. So I do expect that I will be presenting to them. I've, we've also reached out to the real estate representatives because of some of the concerns about time of sale. Um, so I, I think that there will be sort of a dog and pony show it, that I plan on doing over the next six months um, in terms of what I want the commission. I, I think that um, there will likely be changes that are going to come up as we continue shopping this around and as we hear from the other commission. So uh, the recommendation is basically an endorsement from this body to um, that you are supportive of what you have seen changed um, and that ultimately you're you are in favor of us taking this to the Board of Supervisors because that's really where your authority is. It's it, you're an advisory body to the Board of Supervisors. The other steps such as the Planning Commission and the Coastal Commission are sort of also beyond that. So, um, you know. Yeah, but I mean, it would also be good before we went to the planning commission to know that the water advisory yeah. commission was satisfied with yeah. it. So what if we had a motion that was something like, you know, yes, advance your public outreach on this to other commissions and entities. And then after you've done your outreach and we've received feedback, come back to the advisory commission, this commission, mm -hmm. and make a recommendation for approval or not to the board of supervisors. Yeah, it seems that's a little I agree. to make a recommendation to the board approval before we hear the well, it could change actually. But I would, yeah. I would feel comfortable sort of giving it a blessing, like, you know, one, I think staff did a tremendous job hosting the technical workshops, providing a lot of information, bringing in experts like Dave here and others. Um, but those were all sort of closed door meetings so that this is really the first opportunity for the community yeah. here. We don't have a great, I mean, we appreciate everyone who's online. <laughs> we don't have a huge turnout today, and so I think, I think there's more that can be done to yeah. get the word out about this, and I can certainly help in South County. Yeah. Um, so, you know, given that, I I would, you know, I would move that the staff, um, you know, that the Water Advisory Commission sort of bless this in terms of moving out to further public outreach and mm -hmm. sharing it with the agencies, receiving input, and then bringing it back to this commission for further discussion when the time is appropriate. So do you, um, that's fine. Um, just structurally, the next, we'll, we'll, so you're saying we'll go to the planning, we'll do our, um, our presentations, you know, we'll talk to the real estate agents, talk to South County. Um, I'm not sure how many other, there aren't a lot of parties that are going to be greatly impacted by this. And I feel like we've really worked closely with the environmental groups, which was sort of the other big piece. So I don't expect a huge amount of um, change, but there could be some um, and some potential clarifications required on our part. After the planning commission, it goes to the board once to basically get their general buy before we then go to the coastal commission. And then it goes back to the board. Do you want it to? It doesn't even have to go back to the board. And it doesn't if there's no changes. Yeah, the board essentially adopts it, and the ordinance says that this shall go into effect upon certification by the Coastal Commission. Okay. So, yeah. okay. the Coastal so Commission makes no changes. 
Uh, for instance, when we updated the sewage ordinance recently, the Coastal Commission said this is a de minimis amendment and they didn't even take it to the full commission. The executive officer just said, this is good. We recommend that it just be approved, you know, approved de minimisly, which meant it didn't actually go to the full Coastal Commission. So what yeah. what month do you anticipate it going to the board? That was going to be my yeah, And, and, and the whole thing about our sort of farmers, you know, yeah. I want to make sure that the farmers have an opportunity to really dive into this yeah. if they want to. Um, I think realistically, probably won't get to the board until December or January if it's going to go to the planning commission in um, the fall. So we could bring it back to this body October or December. in October or December, depending on the, probably December, just realistically. Um, yeah, that would know. be good, I think. Maybe can we work on tightening the, the motion. that motion yeah. and that and so we can make it. No, sorry, sorry. And don't forget public comment before we Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, so wouldn't you want to solicit input from the large stakeholders like the large farmers that you know have a vested yeah. interest in that? I mean, wouldn't that be part of your public hearing process but, above and beyond? Planning Commission, realtors, I don't know what you're saying, right? Dr yeah, the drillers, you know, the commercial. Yeah, well, we've had the drillers involved. And I guess Robert Wall was not a Farm Bureau representative. No, we haven't had a representative of the Farm Bureau. They didn't, uh, yes. they didn't chose not to participate. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a normal process. You say, oh, we've changed this ordinance for wells. In the county, and then just make it public record. And the people yeah, it, read the news or not. I mean, ordinances don't need to be read twice. I, I, well, that's not that, like, yeah, well, that, that is one thing, but you want to do your public outreach well before that. Yes. yes. Yeah, we don't, yeah. We don't this, want to hear from This meeting was intended to be a significant part of public outreach in terms of the. You know, the mailing list for the Water Advisory Commission was really extensive. We used to do additional folks. Yeah, and we also did, um, uh, I sent it to both the county's PIO and our local PIO, and they did, did. social media. But I don't know, I didn't actually see any of it, but I did send it to them, and they did say they were distributing it. Um, and we did announce it at the Water, at the Commission on the Environment, which also had a big um, turnout because they had a lot of outreach at theirs. So, um but yeah so i'm i'm thinking just it sounds like before we go to the board of supervisors we will be doing our a lot more outreach over the next probably month and a half two months it'll go to the planning commission which will be another that gets a lot of attention um so if people haven't heard of it by then they'll hear of it if they follow along they'll hear about it at the planning commission then we'll bring it back to this body for kind of yeah, uh, we maybe try to amend the yeah, I was just going to say so. So let's do that. But do you want to just yeah, while you're thinking public. about that, do you mm -hmm. want to do we have any public comment? Um, anybody online? There's nobody here in the room. Yes, Chris. Hi again. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. I know we're running late, but I'm just going to run through a couple comments and then I have a couple questions at the end. So um first of all awesome job this looks really good overall i did have a couple questions about karst i'm going to focus there because that's my favorite thing um we do have a broader range of comments on other issues that we provided to staff if the rest of the commission would like to see those i'm sure we'd be happy to provide those um new since this ordinance was last updated in 2009 thanks for that historical perspective sierra um the, the Water Advisory Commission has been working on Cars Protection Zone planning and was instructed by the board to help various departments um, fold in car protective language into various county codes. So we've done that with the septic ordinance um, already with uh, John Ricker's help, of course, and I think this is a unique opportunity to advance that further um, with the well ordinance. Um, one thing that I had a little concern about is the way Karst is contextualized in the um, packet you got. It's actually a little bit more widespread than is um, presented in the packet. And I think to that point, it would be good to get a map that we all agree on in terms of where we're going to address Karst resources. Um, Karst, well, it may seem like a niche issue, does provide water supply, particularly in drought. 
and during um, you know weather whiplash type atmospheric river events to over 100,000 people, as well as two federally listed species and probably a few other species I'm not focusing on right now. But um, I think that the summary document was super helpful, but it, it did only mention solution caverns in terms of karst features, and it probably should be more well aligned with other karst features as well as is described in the um, sewer ordinance, um, septic ordinance. Let's see, what else? I'm trying to race through this. I think that um, I understand the focus on non-de minimis wells, but I think the reality is that, and this is getting to that water quality question I asked earlier, even a residential well in cars could have significant impacts on other adjacent wells and streams and groundwater quality. So um, while I'm not recommending that there be a higher level of review for de minimis wells, I think having a set of best practices for those wells would be appropriate. Um, and I can go through that list now, or we can have everyone have a chance to get out of here and have a little bit less painful meeting if I hold that. But there's really just a handful of um, best practices that I think would make that make a lot of sense. And it's consistent with, with what other jurisdictions do that are a little more familiar with managing karst resources. Um, finally, uh, we have a bunch of hydrology data we'd, we'd be willing to provide. I apologize, Sierra and John, for getting you that North Coast data so late. Um, like you, things are a little bit frantic in the city and that slipped. But we also have Newell Creek hydrology, if that would be helpful. Um, and now onto my questions. So would that language about allowing water purveyors to review permits apply to tiers one through three as well as four? Yeah. In yeah. which case, um, that would be great in terms of, you know, if we can I agree on an area of you know, a general karst protection zone, then maybe that's how we sort of pare down the city's role in, in working with the county on this stuff. Um, and then the last question, um, I, I heard you reference a flow reduction standard. I think it was 1% um, before a well might bump up into another tier. Um, but how does that work in a system like the San Lorenzo that's fully appropriated? If your well pumping season is during the fully appropriated season, being the summertime, um, any reduction in flow is considered significant. So um, I know water rights and groundwater are sort of a emerging area of water policy, but um, do you have any thoughts on that? That's the end of my comments and questions. Thanks. A yeah, number of streams are fully appropriated and we essentially took that or we noted that but um i don't know that state law has really gotten to the point of how to, how to address groundwater impacts and fully appropriated watersheds um but we do have a, a pretty strict limit on any additional depletion i mean I, I, the, for the san lorenzo i think it was 0.12 cfs was the was the allowable additional. So it's pretty minimal. Uh, and it's certainly, it's probably less than what's really measurable. Um, so I think we've done what we can do with that. I don't think we can, you know, say nobody can drill a domestic well in the San Lorenzo watershed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's what I was suggesting, John, but, you know, wells that are adjacent to the river that will be having a measurable impact on flows in the summer, that does seem to have a little bit of a rub with the fully appropriated status. Yeah, well, they would have to have a setback or the deeper seal to really minimize their, their impact. But again, if somebody's property is only so big, um, you know, if, if, if it's a non-de minimis well, then it's going to require a evaluation and potential denial if it doesn't meet that requirement but a, a de minimis well there's not a lot i don't know that there's a lot that we can do with that one other than the, re, the setbacks and the deeper seals okay for time i'd like to see if there's any other public comment it's seeing none Okay, then let's go 
and try to form that motion quickly. I could just rescind my motion altogether. And, I mean, I guess the question is if it's going to come back to this commission before it goes to the board. That's what you don't have to later. Staff yeah, do you, do you well, really want or need anything now? I, I would like to have some sort of blessing from this body that I can tell the planning commission. Exactly. Because yeah, yeah, that's the, what we need. Yeah. So you could maybe recommend that we that you it's hard because you aren't a recommending body to the planning commission so um you maybe recommend pursuing the process of ultimately bringing this to the planning or to the board of supervisors um and ask to see it again before it goes i guess one thing i'm wondering is are there things that you would like to see changed so I, I personally served on the yeah. and also I commented that if they could get better for someone else to make the motion, I wasn't on that. So Brian, you're saying you support it 100% today, but you're saying because it has potential of changing before it finally goes right to see it. Yeah. the supervisors, you don't want to approve something that you don't have to say what it looks like. I mean, you're, you're going towards the worst case scenario. I, I support yeah. all the work that's gone into it. I think it's very good, you know, um, but I would like to I think I'd like to ensure that other interested parties mm -hmm. had an opportunity yeah. to receive, you know, maybe a slimmed down version of the presentation. <laughs> that's what yeah. 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 <laughs> so that um, and they can weigh in on this before, before we yeah. fly. Well, we actually practice. agree with that. Yeah. I feel yeah. like I understand this that. shouldn't be ran through. So, yeah. It's been 15 years since the last one. <laughs> can we do a water down that we approve of the process? And we approve that we continue the process as it moves with. So I I would go further than that. I would say that we approve the process and we and we support the work that's been done so far. Um, you know that I, I I mean I think it's a great uh, deal of work and that you know subject to uh, you know further review by other bodies we we would support uh you know taking this you know to the board of supervisors mm -hmm. uh, and that review would occur in december that second yeah you well, thought my motion was ambitious <laughs> <laughs> uh, well i also moved to extend um Appreciation to the subcommittee. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 definitely. The, the technical yeah. advisory committee yeah. worked yeah. very, very yeah. hard. Yeah. Do, do you want? OK, so I have. You Go want ahead, me? Sierra. Yeah. Uh, what, what I wrote down was um, the commission would vote to approve the process and support the work of the, the work presented, subject to further review by other interested parties. And recommend taking it to the board of uh, except it recommend moving forward, moving forward with the process. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about uh, further review in December? I would limit it specifically. Uh, yeah, I it, 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 I was it could be as early as October if you yeah. complete mm -hmm. the review. Yeah. Um, to return to the WAC before proceeding to the Board of Supervisors. Yes. Yeah. Um, kind of a side question. Chris Berry had a bunch of feedback and notes, and I was just curious if we are, are the, the group is going to respond to some of his suggestions. And yeah, we would like to hear his, uh, his best <laughs> practices to. Well, I think that's the whole thing, right? Because we struggle, we struggle with cars. And what, what, it was easy with the sewage ordinance because it's pretty straightforward what you do about cars with sewage. But with wells, it's I'm not real clear on what kind of best practices that so are we, beyond we are our party doing. Yeah. Chris is one example, right? We heard from Chris today. Yeah. There may or may not be others, but I think it'd be good to hear from everyone else who might be interested and then have one more shape. Well, and, and Ray suggested adding, adding the definition of streams, which I think is a yeah. good suggestion. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely do that too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are still, I mean, 
we've made a lot of change. We're, we're, we're to the point where we're fairly satisfied with it, but we're, there's also things we probably missed, and we don't mind those being pointed out. <laughs> but, but so, I mean, as, as this is socialized among technical people on the departments, like, you know, City of uh, yeah. Santa Cruz Water Department, if those departments come back with suggestions, or critique, or as we say, you know, car definitions, what's going to happen? I mean, is, are those going to go back to the work, the technical advisory committee and change it, improve it, or, it would, or is it as it would I think a lot of what we're seeing is fine tuning that probably would not need to go back to the TAC if there's something. And the tip, we're going to send it all. I mean, the TAC's going to be on the district sure, sure, sure. list on, on what we move forward so, with. So. so, so what I'm hearing you saying those those tweaks or those fine tuning can be made and then yeah. be sub submitted to the TAC for a sort of informational basis before yeah. it goes on to yeah. the yeah. next steps. Yeah, yeah, and we've already been doing that. We the last TAC meet since the last TAC meeting, we've still had several calls with environmental groups. We have had a call with the um, city and, and some of the other water districts. And, you know, the, we still have the realtors and the ag community that we need to meet with. But um, I think if it goes back to the tech, it would likely, we'd likely wait until after we've at least started hearing from Coastal Commission staff because they could have significant changes. Well, the, plan, the planning commission may the planning have something commission too. Too. It's, it's hard to say. Sure, are we anticipating any additional comments from the fisheries agencies and so forth? Yeah, we've they been done? very quiet. I don't know what to <laughs> inter comment. interpret that one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we've had a lot of back and forth for a long time. Yeah, so we'll think that's that's right. Right. I mean, we, I feel like we've satisfied I, what we could. Yeah, I think we really explain to them where I think they understand more where we're coming from and that our situation is not necessarily the way it is in the rest of the state. So one of the key things is going to be to, you know, have people not say, well, we want to do exactly what Santa Cruz did when they had these huge wells that may be going in right next to the stream. So um, I think we're, we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll probably get a critical letter from Noah Fishery. <laughs> yes. but, so let's yeah let's just can we... yeah so this is now how i have this written <laughs> um, the commission approves the process and supports the works and subject to further review by other interested parties and recommend moving forward with the process with action to return to the commission the water advisory commission before proceeding to the board of supervisors right that, that looks good and the motion came from me and i'll second it if you have no reception I think I seconded it already, but you can you can add. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And okay. we do have specific comments. Yeah. That we're yeah. 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 It's not too late. <laughs> yeah. Are we or okay? Or questions, comments, or questions. Sierra, are we okay to do it with Darren? Is it not recorded? Um, it looks set recording. It was. It looks like it's still recording. Okay. It's still recording. Okay, great. Well, um, with that, I'm going to, I think the meeting's over, so I'm going to end the recording. Thank you, everyone who did show up. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.